Good afternoon, Dr. Stryker. Thank you for accepting the Wagner interviews as part of the In Conversation series presented by the KT1 Foundation based in London as part of the global anniversary celebration of Richard Wagner's 200th anniversary. The first question is, do you still remember the first time you heard Richard Wagner's music? Yes, it was uh, shortly after the war. I was still a very young boy and my first opera performance was really Wagner Valkyrie. It was a very old-fashioned performance, but the music, the uh, singers, and especially uh, the, the, yes, the incredible music was a great experience for me, and from that time on, I'm an, a great admirer of his music. Do you listen to recordings of Richard Wagner often? Well, for me, Richard Wagner is mainly an event, so I prefer live performances, but if I listen to uh, recordings uh, occasionally, I uh, forget uh, rather soon the stage, and I see uh, that his music is very powerful, like a big mountain. And therefore, uh, the attempts of many stage directors to uh, put their ideas against the intentions of Wagner are not uh, valuable, and uh, his music is not vulnerable at all. Schott has been publishing Wagner since the last decade of the composer's life. Would you like to share with us your family tie with the German composer over the ages and the story behind how Schott has published his music? Well, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Actually, I'm the great-grandson of his publisher, Ludwig Strecker, my great-grandfather, who became a Schott publisher when he was 23 years old in 1874. Uh, Franz Schott, the former owner of Schott Music, uh, had no heirs and so he had to give it in new hands and he selected my grandfather, uh, great-grandfather, and uh, this was uh, a very, very good beginning of a very long story and a very close relationship and the first big event was that Wagner invented uh, advance payment and he asked for Parsifal a huge amount of 100,000 gold marks, which is the equivalent of about 1 million euro nowadays. And uh, it was paid, and it was a big success. Also, at those days, uh, the copyright protection period was only 30 years uh, long. So the ties were very close and familiar, and so it was also supposed that uh, Wagner became godfather of my grandfather but uh, my grandfather was born 13th of uh, January 1883 and Wagner just died one month later. So we only have a very nice greeting card to the birth, but uh, unfortunately he was dead. So uh, the relationship between Wagner and uh, Schott and Strecker was very close on a very personal level and uh, he, he was living close to Mainz in Wiesbaden where he finished Meistersinger and at those days he was still married to Mina but he met Mathilde Meyer, uh, uh, so-called höhere Tochter from Mainz but since he was married he was not allowed to meet her in the public so he asked uh, Schott please provide me with a separate room with a big chaiselongue and thick curtains in order to have my conversations with my fiancé and uh, yes and this happened for quite some time it was a very good and a very wonderful relation between the two but uh, she denied to marry him and uh, it shows now how close this relationship is and nowadays his room is my office and since that time we uh, Wagner is really our uh, main composer and we are very happy that during the 200 years anniversary we are able now to present the full and finished complete edition of his works. Hesha Wagner is a librettist, a composer, a father of a son and a, one of the first generation of producers around the world. What means most to you for Hesha Wagner's various contribution to the artistic world? Well, I think his biggest achievement is that he uh, fulfilled all his visions. First, he started with the Gesamtkunstwerk, which I think was uh, absolutely great. He uh, 
he found new dim dimensions of music and composition and musical instruments. And he had his own Festspiele and he uh, was more or less completely independent uh, what he wanted to do. And also to add two achievements after his death, uh, that uh, the so-called secondary literature about his uh, life and works is unchallenged by numbers. And the fan clubs worldwide are the strongest one probably in the musical uh, community. Could musicals or music theatres be, be the new, the renewable, you know, uh, renewal spirit of operas in the, in the future? Well, I think uh, what we have to uh, accept is, and if Richard Wagner would be alive, he definitely would not live in, in Europe, but in America, where the musical <laughs> tradition is really alive. And he would adopt, I'm sure, the way how uh, musicals are produced. Uh, and one of these aspects would be the absolutely perfectionism of any performance. The fantastic way of putting all powers together. This, I think, is something uh, which it has been achieved by the musical productions and the opera house. And many new opera houses uh, challenge this uh, uh, very much and very successful. Pierre Boulez uh, once mentioned um, that opera houses have to be destroyed. Uh, in the meantime, he has a different opinion and I think the world has seen that also many things have changed. This category has maybe a stronger effect to our uh, present life than ever. And I think the opera still will remain as a very, very important factor of uh, artistry and uh, musical achievement. And I think there will be new dimensions. There will be maybe not opera houses anymore alone. It will be public performances outside in new areas, etc. So opera becomes maybe much more open-minded to the world. And so I, I see the future just starts now. Thank you.